15. There is one back there called the Gospel of John. It's a little commentary to the Gospel of John. It's only five dollars. Um, and it's really good because it uh, will help people begin to, to see why did Jesus say what he said and what was he thinking. If you can think like Jesus thinks, why can't you have what Jesus had, right? So that's kind of the, the, uh, what the commentary is like. If you endeavor, if you like this, next 30 minutes, this is what we're, we have out there that's called what is reality. And in fact, there are some little almost looks like a credit card, but it pops up with a USB or whatever little thing there. You can plug into your computer. I think there's 80 sermons for just $30 out there. So some really good deals out there on the, on the table. I didn't come here to sell anything, um, but we want to share some of that with you in case uh, you'd like to go a little further. Okay, let me start out by saying, I thought, I thought this is really cool. If you don't think this is cool, then th that's fine. Maybe, maybe you're... <laughs> Maybe your wood's too wet or something. I don't know. <laughs> but 2,000 years ago, when the Magi were following the constellation of the stars that led them to know that there was something special getting ready to happen, to find Jesus, three planets came together, and the hue, I mean, of Saturn, hue meaning... The, the energy of those planets coming together and the brightness of what took place when they did come together created a very bright star in the sky that we call the Bethlehem star, the Christmas star, the star that led them to know the child will be found in that village. That was 2,000 years ago. It hasn't happened for 2,000 years. But it just happened again in July. I believe it was the 17th of July, the Bethlehem star. I woke up in the nighttime, went outside and looked at it, and sure enough, it was not just a bright star. The bright star had a glow all around it because there were planets that were aligned together to make what stars they were. In other words, the light of those stars to make it more illuminant. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? It happened again in July, 2,000 years later. Now listen to this. The constellation that was in the sky when it happened the first time was the constellation Virgo for Virgin. It foretold, the stars foretold that there was a virgin birth. 2,000 years later, those stars aligned again and the constellation that was in the sky in July 17th was Leo for the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He came as a baby, he's coming as a king. If God's that interested, and that's just tidbits of what he's getting ready to do, if he's that interested in showing you sign after sign after sign that I'm coming, why is he that interested? He doesn't want anybody to miss it. Yes. There's over 172 migratory flesh-eating birds that have all of a sudden in the last five years shown up in the land of Israel. Why? That's God's cleanup crew. You'll find that the prophets prophesied after the battle of Armageddon that even the fowl will eat of the flesh. They're in Israel right now. One little sign after another sign after another sign that God's trying to get a point across. I'm coming again. I'm coming again. And I don't want anybody to miss out. You know, when you hear scriptures like, if God is for you, who can it be against you? There's more meaning to it than just rah, rah, bang, bang. You know what I mean? I mean, God, God is so for us. He wants us to get this. And in the midst of all of this, I found some scriptures that just kind of rang my bell a little bit, to be real honest with you. I'll let you just hear some of it over in Revelation chapter 2. And turn to verse 7 and verse 11. <laughs> Revelation 2, verse 7 and verse 11. And what I found over here in Revelation, because you know, if we're getting close to the book of Revelation, that's a pretty absolute book. You know what I mean by absolute? In other words, 
very clear cut, no nonsense. It can't be anything but what it is. So you can say, well, yeah, but Lord, and I, um, and can't you just bend and can't you just change and no. The book of Revelations shows us there's a right side to be on and a left side to avoid or a right side and a wrong side. And what side do you want? Well, I've been saved going on now 50 years. Saved. I still remember my mother put me on the counter when I was a little boy, and I asked my mom, will you help me to accept Jesus as my Savior? It meant enough to me as a little boy that I preached to all the kids in my, in my uh, neighborhood. As a good old Baptist boy, we learned that Roman road right from the very beginning. For all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God, none are righteous, no, not one. If you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, thou shalt be saved. With the heart man believes in the righteous confession, with the mouth is, mouth is unto salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's right. The wages of sin is death, the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I knew that little, those little five Roman roads so well, I took all my friends into their closet because that's what I heard the preacher say. You go into the closet and you close the door. <laughs> and I'd preach to them my little Roman road. I mean, I'm talking about I'm only four years of age. I preached to them my little Roman road. And when I got done with my little sermon, I'd ask them, do you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Would you like to confess his name right now? And if they said yes, it was a very easy salvation. If they said no, I held their head down until they said yes. <laughs> I had 100% salvations. <laughs> Amen. Until I got old enough to realize I, I wasn't growing as big as some of the people, so you just couldn't force them, you know what I mean? No, I've been saved for 50 years, but there's a part in something inside of me is seeing what's going on. And even though I'm living right, walking right, honoring God right, there's still something inside of me that's jumping on the inside. Where I know the Lord's coming, the Lord is coming, He's coming. Let's get right, let's purify ourselves even as He is pure. You say, oh my gosh, you're making this sound like it's a, a sin sermon. No, 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 it's a choice sermon. We need to be more conscious of our choices. You know, there's a wonderful scripture, and Moses was the one that put it in there, you know, over in Deuteronomy that said, I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, choose life. Well, notice, Moses, life, blessing, cursing, death. Five, if you could say, people or entities or thoughts in that one verse, but only one person has the choice. Who is it? Moses. Who is it? You. Do you know that death can't choose you? You have to choose it. How do you choose death? By not choosing life. You mean, I don't have to just be cursed in this life? Oh, no. You choose it. Oh, I would never do such a thing. We do it all the time. By what? By the way the world spins. Kind of sounds like a soap opera, doesn't it? By the way the world spins, if we don't question whether it's accurate reality, the next thing you know, we buy into the way the world does things. Well, of course, if you're feeling bad, you better go to the doctor. And immediately then we just buy into that's the way you do things. And then after you go to the doctor and you have four, four different people look at you and give you all kinds of bad reports, then you come to the church and, and try to believe God. That has become the norm of the way that we think in the church world. I know I believe I received my healing. I'm just waiting on the manifestation. But you see, someone in the church created that. As what? As an excuse for just being responsible enough to say, I'm wrong in what I'm doing because it's not working. But instead of saying I'm wrong, we spin it to say, oh no, I believe I received my healing. I'm just waiting on the manifestation. But look at what you're saying. You're saying, I'm perfect in the way I believe. If the Holy Spirit could just get up off his rear end and do something, we'd have a healing. That's what we're saying. Huh? I'm waiting on the minute. I'm waiting on the Holy Ghost. Waiting on the Holy Ghost. And he, I've been waiting for six months. But I know he's just about getting ready. No, no, no. That's no different than when Mama says, and now my wife, looking at our children, says, food is hot. Come and get it. Well, when do you come? 
Because you better believe right now. Huh? Yeah, Yeah, right now. Come on, do you remember when you were little? There wasn't a choice. You come, well, I'm kind of busy. No, you're not. (laughs) Huh? I mean, the respect for having someone cook you a meal is to show up when you should be there. I mean, hey, you know, I I, uh, got out of college and then went to Rama and I got married at 29, and so I had at least a good four or five years in there where I was cooking for myself. It was survival. (laughs) And then when my wife started cooking, and I thought, oh my gosh, that tastes good. And she said, would you you mind getting a few things from the store? It's like, no, I'll go whenever you want me to. If you can make it taste like that, I'm in. Amen. Never forget the first time she asked me to go. We were only married within a couple of weeks. She said, will you go get me a few things at the store? I said, I'd love to. I'd love to. Uh, she, I said, what are they? And she named them off. And I said, good. I, I turned, to, turned to walk away. And she said, well, here, you've got to take the list. I said, take a list? For the five things that you said? She said, do you want to take the list? I said, I don't need your list. I can't remember five things. I'll be back. And I walked out the door. Now, growing up in New York, you know, we were very vocal when it comes to how we drive. Hey, what's wrong with you? You know, we are very vocal. You know, and somebody cut in front of me on the way to the grocery store. Well, I can't just let that happen. <laughs> I laid on the horn, said a few choice words, and then continued on my way, you know, to the grocery store. Well, I made myself up a little song, number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, you know, because I didn't want to forget. I already got my name out there, you know, my word. So after I went, after I went ahead and said that, you know, and honked the horn, number one, number two, number, oh my God, where'd number three go? Number four, number... <laughs> And I lost number five, too. <laughs> Later on, I figured out that guy that cut in front of me, he took him. <laughs> but, but anyhow, I'm in the store, and I, I took number one, number two, and number four together. I put them together, and I thought, <clears throat> what do you think she'd be making for number one, two, and four? And then I came up, well, that's got to be three and five, then. And I went ahead and got three and five. Walked in the door, put it down on the counter, said, there you go, hon, you got them. I was walking out the door as fast as I could, and I heard, what's this? I said, it's number three. What's this? It's number five. (laughs) She comes walking. She goes, it is not number three and five because she had the what? The list. (laughs) So I always take a list anymore. (laughs) So what is reality? Come on, let's think about this. You're over here uh, in Revelation chapter 2 and 7. It says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I'll give to, uh, give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Verse 11, he who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Now there's something that's very interesting. This is Jesus speaking to John about the condition of the churches before we enter into the tribulation period. And he says, to him who has ears, let him hear. Which means what? Maybe there are those that won't hear. And then he says, to him who overcomes, which also says what? How many are going to overcome and how many are not going to overcome? And the conditions of each time that the Lord spoke about the church the thing that he warned everybody about was, and all in a different variety, but of each of the seven churches, he warned them about how real and how in touch they are with the world. And as a result, how they're losing touch with him. Some of it came out with the thought of, you've left your first love. Because if you think about it, the Apostle Paul, in all of his writings, and we know that he wrote the majority of the books in the New Testament, okay? The Apostle Paul's writings are not only to remind you how you came into this amazing salvation because Jesus shed his blood that brought us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of his love, and we have a redemption, my God, that sets us apart as sons of God, and in us we have the power of Christ in us to honor and worship God and do the works of Jesus in this day. But the rest of his writings are all about, are you kidding me? 
Who's bewitched you? You started out on the road of the miraculous and now you've gone back to the road of the flesh? Why are you existing in the realm of the flesh and of the world? You used to be there, but you've come out. In other words, on one hand, Paul was encouraging them with the salvation that they experienced. On the other hand, he's a backseat driver giving them the business about why did you let go My, um, my magnet doesn't have anything to hold on to. <laughs> it's probably somewhere where you can imagine. Anyhow, it's... <laughs> That's all right. I'll just hold it right here. Okay? We doing okay? We're doing good. Told you, it's a different service. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm waiting for it to come, <laughs> come out of my... My drawers here, you know? <laughs> All right. Okay. You got another one? Oh, piece of tape. Thank you very much. We're making this up as it goes, folks. It's all good. So if you think about it, what's Paul trying to do? He's trying to separate what is reality and what is not reality. Now, for just a moment, let's go to a scripture over in Galatians, because I want you to see this. Because so many people will blame the devil for what choices they're making. Listen, listen, this is, this is not to make you feel bad. This is just to help us to really get real with each other. How many of you know that if you don't know where you are, who you are, how you make choices, then how can you break a mold that's not working if you don't know what the mold is? Okay, let me, let me do it another way. For those of you that are young over here, have you ever on your phone typed, used the Maps, the Maps app? Has anybody ever used the map? You need to know where you're going. Maybe, maybe you guys just know everything about the state of California and you know exactly where to go. <laughs> or you've used the Maps, right? You type in or you use Siri, you know, to, to say, I want to go to such and such and such a place, and it brings it up and a little pin drops, right? But in order to get there, don't you have to have another location? Or it says usually current location, right? And if you have current location, you can push start and it says, This is where I am and this is where I need to. If you don't know your current location, huh? But see, why would we want to know our current location? Because there might be some hidden things under the rug, some skeletons in the closet. Every human being has the ability in their mind to sweep under the rug what you don't want to deal with. It can become so a part of your life that you don't even know that you're walking around a huge bump in the carpet that you've swept for years, part of your life underneath there that you just don't want to acknowledge. Paul tells us over in 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, chapter 13, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 13, uh, 7, he tells 5, 6, and 7, he tells us, examine yourselves. The message says, find out whether it's working or not, and if it's not, do something about it. In other words, we need to constantly be putting to test our salvation. Am I getting answers to prayers? If I can't get an answer to my own prayer, then I need to ask myself a question, why not? Listen, here's the deal. Whatever is most real to you is where you will have your strongest feelings, your strongest emotions, and where your creative energy will work. I know you may not like to hear this. You have been privileged, and so have I, to be made in the image and likeness of God. Why did you put it like that, that I might not want to hear it? Because it's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. Well, how could that be bad? Well, it depends on where you point it. What do you mean? If you are made in the image and likeness of God, you are made after the creative order of God. Satan creates nothing. 
He's an angel. I don't despise that because angels have an importance. But they're messengers and they're helpers of God's plan. They're not above us in rank, folks. It's God, it's Jesus, it's the Holy Ghost, and it's man. We're the only people breathing on the face of the earth, the only spiritual beings that have been included into the creative order of God. We didn't do it. If you don't like the fact that it's that way, you really don't have anything to say about it. God made you for fellowship so that he could worship with you and fellowship with you on the same level where he wouldn't have to come down to a lowly level. He could create you in his own image and own likeness so we could hang out, walk together, and honor one another. It doesn't put us above God by any means, but it does put us on a place where the same creative ability that's in God is in us. And whatever you fasten your emotions and your feelings and whatever becomes real to you, your choices in that area will create that reality. Now, I'm going to show you how ridiculous it can be on the negative sense. The man that ran a 26-mile run called a marathon woke up the next day and just had a little bit of pain in his chest, which, hello, you're breathing like a maniac for 26 miles. But your negativity in your mind says, maybe I better get this checked. And you go into a doctor and he says, you've got fourth stage cancer. And within 24 hours, you walked in, but you left in a wheelchair and never got out of it and died within a couple of weeks. If someone would have just told him it was gas, that always seems to have a way of working its way out, doesn't it? (laughs) Sorry, that's not real good in a church. (laughs) My wife hates it when I use that. But the only reason why I do is because it's so ridiculous that if you were to believe the ridiculous, well, they showed up a tumor in your brain. Well, it's just gas. I mean, that's <laughs> fine. I'm fine. Because it's about what you set your affections on and what becomes real that becomes your reality. Now look at this real quickly here. You're over in Galatians. Aren't you? <laughs> Chapter 5. <laughs> we'll be done in a few minutes here. In verse 16, and it says, But I say, walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, or in the Spirit. Now, I like what's in brackets. Responsive to and controlled and guided by the Spirit. (coughs) This is how we are to live. We're supposed to live our lives, and everything that comes up in our lives, we're supposed to make choices that are controlled, guided, and responsive to the Holy Spirit. So if a a pain came up, what would you do with that pain? Oh my God. Well, I mean, I'd immediately start taking all kinds of painkiller, and I might might call my doctor and ask him, what do you think this is? Or I might get on the internet and just Google it. Everybody Googles everything. (laughs) I mean, it's surprising you can't Google and ask God a question and get the the response off of Google. (laughs) Huh? Just think of the weight that we give something like Google. If we gave that same weight to the Holy Spirit, we'd never have to Google. Come on, think about this. Why does there have to be reality in pain? Why can't it just go as fast as it came? And if I don't give my allegiance to it, then what does it have to hang on to? Well, you understand, brother. I mean, it could be the work of the devil. You gotta understand something right here, right now. You gotta make this, gotta make this an absolute in your life. What do you mean absolute? There is no other. It is what it is, and it's not what it's not. How much power does the devil have if Jesus came out of the grave and the very first thing that he said, I'm gonna say it again, the very first thing that it, do you think it was important to listen to the very first thing he said after he came out of the grave? I mean, he still got sweat off of him. He still got smoke coming off of him, and his eyes are like fire. Have you ever been, I'm talking to guys now, uh, have you ever been in a tussle? You ever been in a fight? You ever been in a contest 
where you had to exert something and somebody exerted it on you and you just went back at them and exerted more. See, I'm a little bit crazy, okay? But anyhow, there's something in you when you get in and you get that emotion going, you get that adrenaline flowing, that after you're done what you're done with, you're standing there like it's over, but inside there's nothing about you that's over. I mean, you, your body's crawling. You're still moving. I mean, I remember being up on the platform with Brother Hagin. There's 10,000 people out there, and we're shouting and praising God and dancing in the Holy Ghost all over the place. Woo! Glory to God. And then we're done, and he prays a prayer, and we come down, and we sit down. Well, we may have been sitting on the outside, but we were still, woo, dancing on the inside. <laughs> Jesus comes out of the grave, and he sees the disciples. In what way do you think he talked? You know, I got all power. Tiny Tim going through the two tulips, you know? I don't think so. We're talking about a man's man where there's fire in his eyes. And he said, oh, power has been. And they were like, oh, my God, split my hair. Yeah, power. <laughs> so quickly, if he's got all, how much does the devil have? Now, you've got to be real careful when you make something absolute. Because then you've got to live by it. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? See, you can talk to somebody and you would say something that I agree with and I said, oh yes, absolutely. Well, then I better live by that. That better mean something. See, back in the day where a handshake was all you needed because a man's word was as good as his bond. Am I talking to anybody? See, those are the kind of days where you swear to your own hurt and you don't change. Today, everything is about get out of jail card free. Even the politicians, and that's on both sides, so this isn't a political statement. All the politicians are doing the same thing. Everybody's opting out and saying, well, well my fault, it was his fault. It wasn't this fault, it was that fault. Well, it was you that did it, not me. Because no one wants to be responsible. No one wants to own up. And it's a virus that's in the world today. And it creeps into people's mind settings so that when they come to church, they do the exact same thing with God. Woo, I praise you, Lord. You're the God in the morning and the God in the afternoon and the God all night long. Hallelujah. And the time by time you get out the door, you don't have a clue what the preacher preached on. You ain't thinking anything about making choices that allow God to be a part of your life. You're going right back to the way you do your Sundays, right back to the way you do your Mondays, and you don't even really come to God unless something goes wrong. Huh? Think about this. See, it's not the devil, he's defeated. He doesn't get any power back until the tribulation. There are seven years that God owes the Jews where things will revert back under the Old Testament law. And under the Old Testament, the devil had power. Remember when Jesus said, we tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy? Remember when he did say that he had, all, he had power over all of the power of the enemy? Not all power, but he had power. When was that? Before he went to the cross. Because when he went to the cross... He died, went down there, and literally ripped hell wide open with the glory that came back into him. And he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. Jesus holds the keys. He's got the power. And the devil won't have any lying power to deceive until the church is gone and the power gets back into the tribulation period. So the devil is not really in the equation right now. It's how you see life. Well, I was so afraid, I just figured that I'd have cancer because I had a little tiny nodule right there and it might turn into cancer. And so I put on three, three pink shirts two days ago and, and I was giving honor to the breast cancer awareness. And all you were doing is making it more aware in your life so that you'd actually have it. Well, brother, I don't like that. You just said something negative about breast cancer awareness. I did. Because the more aware you make yourself of breast cancer, the more there is. Why don't we have a day to honor the crimson blood of Jesus and everybody wear a shirt of crimson blood? Amen. Red. Instead of just one day, why don't we wear it every day of our life? 
and remind ourselves that no devil, no sickness, no disease can ever come upon my life, that I'm in the hand of my Father. But the more you make yourself aware of the trouble of this earth, the more you buy into it, the more real it becomes. Back in my day, you'd have to break your neck and your dad look at you and say, you're fine, get up. <laughs> your arm be twisted back like this, you think it's broken. It's fine, Jimmy, get up. <laughs> you come in and you're all hyped up and your dad kicks you in the seat of the pants and said, go out there and play another couple games of kickball. Yeah. They didn't give you a retlin and say that you had that alphabet disease. <laughs> See, it's what we buy into. It's what we consider to be real, folks. And I'll leave you with this verse of Scripture here. But I say, walk and live habitually in the Spirit, responsive and controlled and guided by the Spirit. Then you will certainly not gratify the cravings and desires of the flesh, the human nature without God. For the desires of the flesh are opposed to the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are opposed to the flesh, the godless human nature. For these are antagonistic to each other, continually withstanding and in conflict with each other, so that you are not free, but are prevented from doing what you desire to do. Come on, think about this for a moment. You have to separate what is real and what is not, what is of God and what is of this world. A real, real concerned father came to Jesus one day and said, my daughter's at the point of death, will you come? Well, Jesus was in the middle of having already had power flow out of him because the woman with the issue of blood had touched the hem of his garment. And he turned around to find who it was, and when he found her, she told the whole story. Well, it was a 10-year story. In other words, maybe they were there for a while. Because by the time they started going toward the house again, Jesus and Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue, all of a sudden, one of the servants came and met them and said, don't trouble the master any further, your daughter is dead. Not your daughter is about to die. Hurry up. But your daughter is dead. Jesus immediately did what? He looked at him and said what? Don't fear, only believe. Or he looked at him and said, that's not the end of the story. There's a whole lot more. Don't even consider it. Just stay with me. Why would you care? Why would you doubt? Why would it matter? Just stay with me. Jesus walks into the midst of all the people crying and weeping because Tabitha had died. She was only 12 years of age. Do you know what he said? This is so sad. You know what he said? He said, are you guys kidding me? It's summer break. Kids sleep forever. <laughs> and guess what they did? He put himself in a position to be laughed at. They laughed him to scorn. They mocked him, laughed at him, tried to make him feel like he knew nothing, and Jesus kicks him out. Takes the mom and dad into the room, and then he got into his karate kid position <laughs> and began to do battle with the devil. You know what he did? He leaned down and said, honey, can you smell breakfast? Oh, I know, I'm hungry too, let's go. And she opened her eyes and said, boy, I'm hungry. Yeah, that's right, let's eat. <laughs> One church I was at, I, I didn't even think of what I was saying. I said, honey, can you smell the bacon? And I thought, oh, they don't, they don't eat bacon. <laughs> so, you know, you gotta be careful what you say. I was recently in this one church, you know, and this guy's sitting next to a lady, and the lady gets healed, and the guy starts to get healed, and, I, and the guy had respiratory problems, the lady had hip problems, and, and I said, well, I said, it's just like God put things back together. Now you can run around after each other just like you did years ago. And they looked at each other and goes, oh, well, we're not married. <laughs> I'm thinking like, well, what are you doing sitting next to each other? <laughs> Insert foot, you know. Come on, think about this just for a moment. I want you to start considering 
Where am I putting my energy? I know that sounds a little new agey, but what I'm saying, where are you putting your energy? Where's your value? What is worth more to you? Oh my God, I love to worship in and praise him. Well, there's a scripture that says where your heart is, is where you will most want to be and where you find yourself being. So if you find yourself being more in the world and more choices of the flesh, then you find yourself being where God is so real and there's a wonderful fragrance of Christ and you're getting answers to your prayers, then really what's in your heart is more to be with the world. I know that's very clear cut and I'm not trying to make you feel sad. I'm saying he's coming again. The Lord is coming again. Jesus is coming any day. And overcomers are the ones who will make choices to get out of the way. Let spirit by spirit take you into experiences where God becomes real. That's how you overcome. You don't overcome by fighting the devil. Jesus already defeated the devil. You overcome by what? By not listening to the mentality to the habits and rituals of the world and the flesh and making choices to say, no, according to what Jesus did, this is how I choose and this is what I do. And the more you begin to make choices, one small decision after another begins to leap. Well, come on, think about it. I know in California it's going to be real hard for you to get this example. But coming from New York, north of Buffalo, where they got six feet of snow in a matter of a couple of months last year, I know something about rolling a snowman. And if you can get a snowball rolling down a hill, it'll pick up steam and it'll pick up snow. And by the time it gets to the bottom of the hill, you got yourself a snowball this big when it started out this big. We've done it for years. If we can get good at fleshing out, can anybody? Huh? Anybody, anybody remember what it was like to flesh out? I mean, yell at somebody, get mad over something, curse somebody out, really do a good job. And anybody, come on, anybody remember what it's like to roll that joint, and take that last little bit of liquor that just liquored you and lathered you up? Anybody remember what it's like to be mad at your wife and be mad at your kids in a way that's just not right? Come on, anybody remember? Oh, because I know you don't remember. You're looking like you've never done anything like that. But what I'm trying to help you with is we are very, very proficient and very, very good at the flesh. People can manifest the flesh just like that. That guy's running 26 miles. Here's one little negative report, and he goes into a panic, and he literally manifests overnight cancer and can't move and dies in a couple weeks. If he would have discarded it and said, it can't be, I just got through running 26 miles, it's got to just be gas, guess what would have happened? He'd be here today, he'd be alive. If we can get good at the flesh, why can't you get good one choice after another? And every choice you make where God, you give him opportunity to be God, he starts to become real. I've listened already, and I'm closing with this. Heather's made a few comments uh, this morning about some healings and about some things the Lord spoke to her. And, and the thing that seems to be synonymous with all the things that she said this morning is, God said this to me. And God put an impression on my heart to say this. And, and God said this about my healing. And God said this about, you know, working out. And God said this about don't give up. And God... That's the only way you'll overcome in this last day. If you allow God to be real. Amen. Let's pray. And thank the Lord for what's going to happen tonight. Father, I thank you for the service tonight.